Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that are able, would you please stand in honor of God's word? Our scripture comes from 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 4, and 11 through 12. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all that you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring you fruition to your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray that this so that the name of the Lord your Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Thank you, Linda, for reading our scripture today. Ms. Camera Lady, does this fit me in with the screen? Much better, thank you. Uh huh. I have to do what she says or I suffer later, you know. Nice well, thanks to Marianne. So, laughter is good in the midst of our tears today. The sermon series this month, the theme is gratitude. And then our sermon title for today is What Are We Grateful For? I mean, I do not think it's by chance that we stand in stark contrast with that question, that it fits for our sermon and our context for today. What are we thankful for? Each day we're faced with some kind of trial. I hate when I stub my toe. I have trouble going, oh Lord, please don't let me stub my toe. It seems like such a minimal thing to ask for. Other people are dealing with much greater illnesses and cancer treatments. We see the news. I mean, there's times when I watch the news, I've just got to turn it off. You know, I want to blame them, those terrible news people. Of course, they go, well, it is what you want to see. That's what you pay for. So it's, it's kind of weird. It's this human desire to go, can I watch that accident one more time? I can't explain it. But they're in our midst. There are issues every day, financial concerns that just come smack up against this idea of we're supposed to be grateful all the time, most of the time. And then what about the idea when someone actually passes in our midst? We feel a grief so heavy that to think of gratitude is impossible. Yet God is there even in the midst of our gloom and doom. With all the negatives, we find hope and gratitude in our lives and in our world. I mean, every year it seems like some type of medical breakthrough has come from modern medicine. In spite of financial pressure, we may not get what we want, but we almost always get what we need, or we find a way, and God helps us find a way. And even though we see the doom and gloom of media, uh, in the media, we do know the final outcome of our world through Jesus Christ. Let us now delve into our scripture for today and see how it addresses gratitude and hope for tomorrow. Please join me in a prayer of preparation. What I'd like for you to do is everyone take a deep breath in and let it out. Oh Lord, we come to you seeking your holy presence in this moment. Speak to each person here and online and provide the message that they need to hear for their individual lives. I pray that my thoughts are your thoughts. My intuition comes from you. 
that the Spirit moves within me so that others hear your words. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So our text comes from 2 Thessalonians. And as I looked at it, the first question I had was, why are there two? And, you know, it didn't take long to look in or even Google the answer, and you find out the Apostle Paul wrote two letters. He wrote the first one. Guess what that one's called? First Thessalonians. You know, this it's not rocket scientists. We're pretty simple people. First and second. Let's take a look. This is the map of Paul's journey. He was a frequent traveler. If he was traveling today, he'd definitely have the Million Mile or the Medallion Club or whatever the status symbol was, the black, gold, purple, platinum card for traveling. He was a traveling person. He traveled over 12,000 miles during his time. And if you look at the white line, this is the first journey of Paul, where he went up to Antioch and back. Then the second one is, uh, his journey is the yellow line. You can see that goes up by Thessalonica, where we're talking about today. And then there's a third journey, which is the blue line. Some of that same area is the second journey. And then that final trip to Rome is in red. So Paul, during this time, penned 14 books of the New Testament. He was a prolific writer. Besides Jesus, I think he had more influence on the New Testament as it is today than anybody else's voice. And it comes from this activity. He wasn't a monk sitting in a cave. Dear Diary, today I dreamed of, no, he was out in the world experiencing Christ with people, teaching, planting, a tremendous encourager and sometimes trying to help shape people. It was a time of shifting in theology. There was a Jewish movement that had been occurring, a religion, and Christ came as a Jew to kind of reform and to breathe life in and to point the way away from the empire and to God. And then out of that, through Paul's writings and work, Everyone is grafted into the tree and included in the people of God. So here's a short list or description of Paul's activities in the journeys just leading up to where we are in 2 Thessalonians. So Paul and Silas fled from Thessalonica to Brea. Then Paul fled to Athens because he was being persecuted in Brea. And he leaves Silas and Timothy there. Then Paul sends word back, instructing Silas and Timothy to come with him to Athens. So then Timothy joins Paul in Athens. And then he was sent back to Thessalonica. Then Paul moves to Corinth. Silas and Timothy come. Timothy. Timothy. That's a combination of Timpani and Timothy. Timothy. Timothy came to Paul in Corinth. Then Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, sends it to the church, and about six months later, 2 Thessalonians is written in response to further information about the church. Now, if you read through Acts, you'll see a lot of what I just covered. It's not laid out in the same way. But you get, you get the idea how there's this going back and forth, place to place, sharing the word, and then the writing of the letters to support the church and to send my, my, my brother Timothy to me and go, go Silas and do that. So they didn't have Twitter and Facebook and email. And, I don't even know. Did they have carrier pigeons and smoke signals? Maybe. But, you know, by foot and hand messenger was the main way. And most likely... Paul walked a majority of those 12,000 miles. Now you can see there were some times they would have taken ship because it's over the blue water. But taking a ship would have been more expensive compared to walking, which was free. Taking a ship may have been safer and faster, whereas walking could have been exposing them to other people. So we don't know why sometimes they were shipping or walking other than whether or not there was water or land available. Now, once they get there, the city of Thessalonica is a 
bustling port, as most of these ports are on the Mediterranean. Remember, sea transport is the best way, the only way compared to overland, which is by caravan and hard and dusty. So if you can send something by sea or travel by sea, kind of like first class now for a traveling person. So this happens to be on a gulf called the uh, Thermatic Gulf. It's about 185 miles from Athens. And it was an important commercial and trade center. News would have come in and out of there from around the world. You can imagine yourself going down close to the port and maybe getting word from someone off a ship, the news from another area. It was the largest city in um, Macedonia and it was also the capital of the province. So this is the context that Paul's writing to, a church that he's planted there. And most likely he did this just 51, 52 years after the death of Christ. And this is when Silas and Timothy returned delivering, after delivering 1 Thessalonians. So let's get into our text for today. It begins, as most letters of the time did, with a sort of greeting much longer than what we'd have done today. We received it from Paul. You can guess what it has said at the top. Dear church. Short, sweet, to the point. That's ours. But when we looked at the scripture, it's much different. To all those in Christ. To the body of the church. Uh, with grandeur and love. I mean, you know, there was a flower, flowery language here. As well, giving glory to God, but as well as the person writing the letter puts their name usually in the front. As opposed to when we do it, if we got the letter from Paul, it'd say, Sincerely yours or yours in Christ, your brother in Christ, Paul. So a little different theme and format there. We move from the introduction into verses 1 and 2, which are the Thanksgiving verses or from one and two, which are thanksgiving, into the next two, and it says, we ought, ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters. So Paul is proud of this church that has been planted. It's growing in spite of struggling. And they're, stri they're striving to make sense of this. What do we continue to do from our past, and what is new? And how do we understand this? It was easier when you were here with us. Now that you're gone, these letters are very important to keep us on the way. He continues, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. Now, although Paul doesn't necessarily spell out what are these persecutions, what the trials are, if we put ourselves in the context, I want you to imagine what it was like for the Jewish leaders of the time, both the lay people and the rabbis and the church body or the synagogue body, dealing with all these people, converts, going over there and worshiping over there, and what were they taking with them that they weren't given here? The money, tithes, offerings. So you know if you follow the money, you start uncovering the real story. So just imagine there was this conflict going on, almost like a church split today. If this church, or if you've been involved with another church, he said, she said. And so there was some kind, we don't know exactly. I'm just trying to imagine what it might be like and kind of share with you what, what it might be like so that we can kind of understand why is Paul writing these people and talking about their persecution and their endurance? Our text then jumps to verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. I love that. It's that idea of praying without ceasing. And then what are they praying for? That God will bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Now, in previous sermons... We've discussed this idea about surrendering to God, pursuing the call of God that God has placed on us and in our life. And that when we do that, life tends to be a little more peaceful. And if we're not careful unpacking that, we end up with prosperity gospel that says, if you do what God says, you will be rich. 
That's not what it says. And that's why I chose the word peaceful. God did not say, Christ did not say, follow me and you will never have any more problems. But there is a peace that surpasses all understanding when we yoke ourselves to Christ, when we pray to God, when we follow God's will, when we surrender. And that's what Paul is trying to get across here. That when you surrender, may God bring you the fruition to every desire that you have. And may you be prompted, your every need prompted by faith. It means that when we're in a relationship with God, when we're turning to God for direction, when we have that feeling of love and grace and hope offered through our relationship with the divine, we are more at peace and at ease with life's ups and downs. And this is what Paul was speaking about when he said, I will bring about your fruition good deeds prompted by faith. Our next our text ends in verse 12. We give the, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, with Christ guiding us, and the grace of God upon you, you may be glorified in Christ. And this is our context for gratitude and why we are to be always thankful. We are to look beyond our immediate circumstances, beyond the earthly vessel we call our body. God calls us to, through Scripture, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. That's from 1 Chronicles 16.34. Yet that flies in the face of where we sit today. We as a body are asking ourselves this morning, how are we to be thankful in light of the news of Alicia Lowe and her husband's death? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's part of our human condition, I think, that just the way we are wired, the way God made us, we ask why. And we try to make sense of the world. It's our reason, our ability God gave us to reason. But too often, we don't know why. Or we don't even like the why that is presented. And this is where God steps in and is present with us as we struggle to know why or in loss of a why. Why do bad things happen to good people? God didn't it, promise an easy way. He did. Is God punishing me can be another question. These are reasonable questions, but to continue down that path can lead one away from the message presented throughout the Bible, what Betty just said. God didn't necessarily promise you an easy way. God promised to be present with you always, to love you, to guide you, to show you the way. And that when you lean into God, you will find a peace that surpasses all understanding. But that can be confused with, if I, if I buy this God thing, life will be easy. Don't buy into that. It's not that it's bad, it's just... It is a different way. It is an in-between way. It is both and at times. I have to suffer and love. I smile and cry. It sunshines and rains. But our human nature and society will often try to push us in a, to, in a didactic dialogue. Yes or no, black or white, left or right. And so much of life is in the middle or without the specific reason why. God's not punishing you, no. Yet, just as we have free will to make choices, and then hopefully God cleans up our messes, there are other forces of nature and evil that make choices and exert pressure. 
did God ordain that or <coughs> present it? No, there are forces present that God then deals with us in, in, in relationship. Storms wreck havoc. God didn't cause that. Nature caused it, and we with God live through it. Fires burn homes. People die. It hurts when these things happen. And we want to know why, and we're angry. We want someone to blame. We want to find out why this happened, and we want to prevent it from happening again. By God, we'll make laws. We'll set up structures. We'll figure out a system so no one has to hurt again. I think that's part of our human nature. And sometimes we do get to structure things, put the bumpers in place so that we stay in boundaries. Even when we do that, it doesn't mean we're going to know why. Even though we want to. When we're at a loss for the answer why, we can depend on God to be with us through the pain, the suffering, and unknowing. That you can depend on always under all circumstances. That God is with you. As I spoke to Frank this morning, I told him, I don't know where this came from, but I felt probably the same feelings you did or in these situations. What do I say? And God, I guess, something gave me the words because I said, I don't have words to change your situation, but I am praying for you and I love you. And crying, he said, I love you too. That is how we live together in community. We still ask why, but we struggle through it together through prayer and love. In 1 Thessalonians it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. We're not being thankful for the pain and suffering, but thankful for the presence of God in our life through Jesus Christ. But upon reading that scripture, you can see how someone could say, well, give thanks in all circumstances. So I'm supposed to give thanks for this pain? No, I mean, you may grow through it, but that's not what it's saying. It's be thankful for God's will and Jesus Christ in your life. Or how about this one? To me, this kind of sets, it sets the stage for life and why we're here and what we're doing. It's, it's like the, the catch-all. You may know it, and you may want to recite it with me, if you care. For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, it's not something that we can just say and magically the pain goes away. Um, and there could be a great separation from what we say and know in our head and what we feel in our heart. But through our faith, we're trying to close that gap and come to some understanding. And John 3.16 is one of the best expressions of the good news that is in the Bible. That God loves us, forgives us, has made us free and forgiven people and because we believe that Christ died for our sins. If for no other reason than this, this is why we can have gratitude and be thankful every day and today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today is uh, the first Sunday, and we practice communion the first Sunday of each month. <coughs> you please turn to page 12 in the hymnal. I'm thinking of it, if when you come up later, if you would like to put money at the rail, that money goes to Family Life Ministries. Every week, someone comes to the church saying, I need help. And I usually try to give them a cup of coffee, a bottle of water, a prayer for some immediate but then we're in partnership with Family Life for food, for help. So your money that go to this make a great impact.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an immediate church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> Here are the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At the top of page 13 now, the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending <coughs> holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you, Lord, gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant through water and spirit. And on that night, which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, God, and gave it to his disciple and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's suffering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make for them Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So we practice uh, communion for the Eucharist, to what we call intention. I'll give you a piece of bread, and you dip it.
into the grape juice and then put it in your mouth. This is an open table. Anyone who desires a closer relationship with Christ is welcome to join us. Let's start with this side. <laughs> If there's anyone who would like to join this community, if you've been sitting on the sideline and thinking, some Sunday I'm going to join, that could be this Sunday. If you don't want to come forward at the, during the song and be received at the end of the worship service, it's quite all right. Just see me in the foyer or reach out another time and we'll find a way to welcome you in a way that's comfortable for you. Now let's sing our closing hymn. 